Vice Elwood is with us now. I think it's fair to say... Good morning, Mr Elwood. I think it's fair to say you're no friend of Boris Johnson, but does he deserve this? Uh, we need to be careful what we say. The Privileges Committee have an important job to we do. We can't influence them, though, can we? Well, this is the point. We need to be careful here because sure, it isn't just the media that's interested in this. The nation is watching and indeed further afield across the world. Parliament has a very solid reputation and we need to uphold that. So let the Privileges Committee do its job. We then, of course, have to vote on that depending on that outcome. And it's important that despite what we think about the personality there, we shouldn't be dazzled or distracted uh, by who this is. We need to allow the Privileges Committee to do that job and then MPs can then follow up from there. I separate that from whether Boris Johnson was appropriate, suitable to be in number 10 or be removed as well. Uh, it became very, very clear that, and it was reflected in the polls that because of Owen Patterson, I think it was the start of it, that he was desensitising the way number 10 operated. He was actually becoming, I think, ill-disciplined. There was a lack of focus, a lack of determination, uh, a lack of clarity as to where the country was going to go, and it became very partisan and populist. That's very separate from whether at the dispatch box Boris Johnson was misleading Parliament, and that's for the Privileges, Privileges Committee to determine and we should allow them to get on with that job. Yeah, but that Privileges Committee, I mean, you're chair of a, of a committee, aren't you? The Defence Select Committee. Um, it's loaded in favour of you guys, there's four of you, as opposed to three others. Are you now inviting me to then make comment on the Privileges Committee as, as well? If, if you don't mind, it, it is best, and I encourage all other MPs to recognise the fact that it will, be, it will damage Parliament's reputation if the process is seen to somehow to be influenced or is not as impartial as it should be. What do you think um, the House of Commons, um, known as the mother of all parliaments, what do you think their reputation is overseas at the moment? Well, I, for many reasons, including what's happened with the Brexit debate, which I'm pleased, you know, away from what's going on in that committee room, we are voting on the, um, on the Windsor framework. Well, you're not really, advance. are you? You're voting on one particular aspect yes, of it. Yes, but it's part and parcel of us drawing a line under the whole Brexit issue, which has troubled us, and overseas, you ask the question, has looked as if we've retreated from the global stage. What we've done in Ukraine is to show actually what we prefer to do is to be an influencer, help shape global events, not be internally domestically focused because that's the way we went and I have to say that's the way the United States went. And that's very dangerous for democracy. It's been watched by our adversaries, not least China and Russia, that want to exploit this and rewrite our rules-based order. What about, these, what about the Russians saying, oh, these weapons that you're thinking of sending to Ukraine, oh, what's in the tip of those and this is not a good idea? Well, I'm glad you asked about that because this is highly... well, I'm glad you like some of my questions, Mr Elwood. Well, it's, it's <laughs> that's, this is my comfort zone, is talking about, you know, UK security and to have... Putin say that he's going to respond because we're using depleted uranium shells. Uh, Russia uses these same, very same shells. They're used across the world. So this is inflammatory. I'd invite the International Atomic Energy Agency to clarify that uh, this is not provocative from a nuclear perspective. This has nothing to do with nuclear bombs, tactical nuclear uh, fissile material. You can't make a nuclear weapon out of depleted uranium uh, shells. This is about Putin ratcheting up and, I think, provoking his own population, who probably know little about this, to say this is what Britain's doing. And, of course, you've got China, President Xi, visiting the adversary, backing Russia uh, as well. We're in a very dangerous place at the moment. It's uh, fundamental that we allow Ukraine to win here, because if Putin is able to declare victory that will support China, China is going to have an almighty clash with the United States in our lifetimes in some form or another. And China wants Russia, or particularly Putin, on uh, their side. That's why he's over in, uh, President Xi is over in Moscow right now. Well, is it or is it his um, I have in my hand a piece of paper moment and he wants to broker a deal between, a peace deal between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine? Oh, he wants to do exactly that. But why do you want to then broker a peace deal when Russia is claiming one fifth of Ukraine? That's not an independent, impartial view that a superpower that's a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council should be promoting. China has clearly now declared its cards to support Putin, to support Russia. And I, I've said this many times here, that our world is slowly, progressively splintering into two spheres of influence. And we've been too slow in recognising where it's going. Two of the five members of the UN um, Security Council there, you know, they, and they're getting together and they're trying to come up with a peace deal. Isn't that their job? 
it's their job to then recognise also that one state cannot attack another state illegally in today's day and age without consequences. So what China is trying to do is saying, right, let's sit down, as things are, as the status quo is, that actually then uh, rewards the bully for what they've done. And don't forget, China is watching very carefully at the precedent that the West sets because it's got its eye on Taiwan. So how, how do we solve the challenge that is Ukraine? Absolutely. We need to lean in and make sure, sure Ukraine wins, flushes out Russia from its territory, not just Donbass, but the Crimea as well. That is taking so a stand. So you think the war only ends when they're out of Crimea? Absolutely, 100%. If there's any part of Ukraine which is left in Russia's hands, Russia, Putin can declare a victory. Putin then survives. He, everything calms down and he does it. He regroups, rearms and does it all again in another part of Europe. Ukraine is just the battle. There is a bigger war taking place in Europe and we really haven't quite understood that. You read the Integrated Review, Refresh, as it's called, this document by the government. They make it very, very clear how dangerous our world, you know, is heading. Unfortunately, we haven't backed that no, up with increased defence But Crimea's spending. been in that position for the last eight years and NATO well, didn't do much about it. You're absolutely right. And it's not just then. It's the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War that we've prog progressively become more risk-averse. Afghanistan was a great example of that, where we eventually gave up. Libya, uh, Syria, Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, all these places that we've wandered into and then lost the strategic patience, the commitment to see it through... And, of course, they've then... The governance has, has fallen apart as a security and so forth. They've become problem states. And, ironically, you then have migration coming from these places as well. So since the end of the Cold War, we've lost our focus, our purpose of what it means to be part of the West, what we believe in, what we stand for, what we're willing to defend. OK. Uh, which way are you going to vote today for the Stormont break? Absolutely in favour. And I would encourage all... Um, uh, and parliamentarians to, to, to lean into that. We need to recognise there was always going to be a problem uh, with this, going back to the referendum, when you have part of the UK with a land border uh, with the EU. The people that did recognise this, ironically, were David Frost, uh, Boris Johnson, Dan Hannan, Nigel Farage, because they wanted to stay in the single market, which would have meant all these problems go away. But, of course, we moved to a harder kind of Brexit, so that then was, was removed. But thankfully, Richie Sunak has reintroduced statecraft back in to number 10, managed to square those circles, build those bridges and get an answer. I really do encourage all MPs to support this. It's what Northern Ireland wants. 40% of Northern Ireland's trade is, goes south. So they absolutely want this to work. We want to actually move forward and draw a line under this. Are you a, are you a fan of Ed Sheeran's music? Ed Sheeran's music. Mm. It was not a question I was expecting to have, but yes, no, I'm... I'm glad, because we've got some. Right. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.